Our Heavenly Father, we thank you today for these that have come our way to study with us, both by the Internet and the automobile. Pray the Holy Spirit would minister the truth of the Word of God to our souls. Pilgrimage. Those who are of us that have come to realize the importance of why Christ was brought into the world. Paul said, Christ came into the world to save sinners of whom I was chief. And he was a very religious man. Religion can't save you. Religion can't save you. Can't save you to give you a pilgrim's identity on earth to give you a heaven's identity after death. So our Father, I pray tonight the Holy Spirit would minister the truth of Hebrews 11.13 to our life. In Jesus' name, amen. Notice on your paper, if you have a study guide, that when you look at the, the 11th chapter of Hebrews, verses 4 through 40, not 10, on your paper it should be 4 through 40, not 4 through 10. When you read this context, you can see that he mentions a whole lot of people. When you look at them carefully, you see that there's four groups. I call them group one, two, three, and four. In verses four through seven, you see the antediluvian. That is the period before the flood, Noah's flood. You, you see Abel and, and, no, and Enoch and Noah. In the patriarch period, group two, verses eight through 22, he lists five people. He mentions Abraham and Sarah, Isaac, Jacob, and Joseph. We know that that's the patriarch period. In group three, he talks about the Jewish people from the conquest, from, the, from coming out of the exodus and doing the conquest of the land all the way through the period of the judges, etc. We call that the Jewish period, 23 through 38. And then in the fourth group is really interesting because everybody prior to that is contingent on the fourth group. Uh, we compared it to a medley relay where the, that fourth runner is important to all the runners. The first runner is important, the second runner is important, the third runner, and the fourth runner. The fourth runner is what completes the whole medley relay. <clears throat> and so we talked about that. Now, what's important when you look at that passage again is something interesting occurs. For example, when you look at each one of those groups separately and look at it, you discover that each group is given by the writer of Hebrews a special doctrinal principle dealing with the faith cycle. Now, the faith cycle is important. You learn that because this whole chapter is about the faith cycle. Hearing the word of God takes you to believing the word of God, to takes you to applying the word of God, to takes it to where God will complete it in your life. A lot of the reasons people are not seeing God actively engaged in their life is they don't understand this, how the faith system works. We walk by faith, not by sight. 2 Corinthians 5, 7. We walk by faith, not by sight. And a lot of people don't walk by faith, they walk by sight, and they can't understand why the dynamics of God is not in their life, because God is not dynamic in your life when you're walking by sight, when you should be walking by faith. Faith is what activates God's grace to be active in your life. That's when God does supernatural things in your life for you. But you've got to understand how this stuff works. You're always going to be shifting from one side to the other, trying to make one thing work for another because you don't understand how God's plan works in your life. You don't understand it. You've been in church half your life, still don't understand some basic principles about how faith works. Where does faith come from, for example? Romans 10, 17 says faith comes from hearing and hearing the word of God. That's not enough. It's got to be moved to believing. Hebrews 4.12, when you hear the word of God, you've got to understand it and then believe it. When you believe the word of God, it becomes faith. Now, faith can, be, can work from your life by application. 
We walk by faith. We walk, not hearing, not believing, walking, living that faith out in our life, volitionally making choices to walk by faith, not by sight. And that brings us to the completion stage where what God has promised you, he is willing and able to complete it. Faith's, faith is God doing for you when you stop trying to do for yourself. He didn't give you the will of God for you have to take it to the bitter end. He gave you the will of God so you could bring it to God, surrender to God, and he could do it. The word of God is perfect. And we're imperfect people. And so he gives us the Holy Spirit, the third member of the Godhood lives in our soul and lives in our body in order to enable us to bring the word of God as the fourth runner into victory. And so here we are. Last week, we studied the, the, the doctrinal principle of the faith cycle in Hebrews 11, 6. And here's what it says. Without faith, it is impossible to please God. Now think about that. Not going to church, not giving your money, not doing good things, not trying to walk up. A straight line. Uh uh. Without faith, without faith being actively involved in your life, it's impossible to please God. And he tells you why. Would you look at verse six? He he tells you why. At the end of the verse, he tells you why. Without faith, it's impossible to please him, God. For he who comes to God must believe that he is God and that he, God, is a rewarder of those who seek him. A rewarder. God is a rewarder to your life of your faith. He rewards your faith. He does not reward sight. He rewards faith. We walk by faith, 2 Corinthians 5, 7, we walk by faith, not by sight. Now, the unbelieving world, they walk by sight, not by faith. If I don't see it, I don't believe it. We walk by faith because we see it in the Word of God and believe it. We see it in the Word of God and believe it. And we walk by faith. And when you walk by faith, God obligates himself to do what he promised you. So, here we're dealing with the second group, Hebrews 11, 13 through 16, which is the whole doctrinal principle of the faith cycle, the faith of life, the life of faith in you. In you. And he says... Without receiving the promise. Without receiving the promises. And he tells you why. He goes through this whole list. He says, but having seen them and having welcomed them, promises, from a distance, and having confessed that they were strangers. Now he talks back to about these people. And that they were strangers and exiles on the earth. And then he goes into that discussion, which we'll take up next week. Look, he's going to go on to tell you why. Listen, and, and this is the concept of pilgrims. Exiles and strangers is the concept of pilgrims. The old church used to preach that. Pilgrims on a journey through this life, headed to heaven. That is absolutely true. It's not that you're not going to heaven. It's that you're not living on earth for God. It's not, that, it's not that you're not saved. It's that you're not living for God on earth. How do I do that? You walk by faith, not by sight. Where does faith come from? From hearing the word of God. What do I have to do? I have to understand it. I have to believe it. 
then I have to apply it. I have to walk it out in my life. And what will God do for that? He will reward your faith. Look, he says he will reward your faith. That's a truth. He's not going to reward your sight, but he will reward your faith. He'll reward it by doing what he promised. Romans 4, 21 is for sure. Without receiving the promises. And listen, they were pilgrims on this earth. We are pilgrims on this earth. Why? Because we're looking, we're going to leave this earth one day and we're going to heaven to be absent from the bodies, to be present with the Lord. If you are a believer in Jesus Christ, that he died for your sins, was buried and raised from the dead the third day, that's what gets you saved, nothing else. For by grace are you saved through faith, and not of yourself. It is a gift of God, not of works, lest any man should boast. You're saved by grace or you're not saved. For by grace are you saved through faith and not of yourself. You understand that? That's Ephesians 2, 8, 9. So I want to talk about three things here about without receiving the promises. The Greek word that is used here is of interest, komizo, the Greek word for received. In the English, they struggle with different Greek words and how to make you understand what it is. This word, komizo, in the Greek language means to carry it, bear it, or receive it. Means to carry it, bear it, or receive it. Now, here's why I tell you this. W.E. Vines, a very Greek, a very good Greek guy, a theologian of the Greek language for the Christian church. W.E. Vines, in his little book, Expository Words, you, you can buy this little book or whatever you want to do. He takes the English word receive and shows there's 19 Greek words used in the Bible for it. The English word receive has 19 different Greek words in the Bible with the word receive. When the writer of Hebrews wrote that, he knew that. He picked and chose a specific word for that. Like I said, if, if you're really interested in a little more, you could buy this little book somewhere or another, uh, W.E. Vine's Expository Biblical Words, and you can see the very thing I just told you. Okay? So he, he's got 19 choices to, for the word receive. He uses komizo. This word means to carry something, to bear it, it means to receive it, which is obvious that you have to receive it in order to carry it and bear it. But that's the, that's the whole idea of the word. Okay? The other thing that's kind of important to this word, komizo, is whether it's used in the middle voice. If it's used in the middle voice, it could be active, it could be passive, or it could be middle in the Greek language. Now listen to me very closely. If it's middle, it can, it can bring a new meaning to it. Some words, passive and middle, carry an important principle. Komizo is one of those words when it's used in the middle voice, and it is in our text used that way. It means to receive, bear, and carry for your benefit. It's to your advantage or it's to your benefit. It benefits you. It benefits you. All these died in faith without receiving the promises. In other words, they took their faith out of the word of God, what God has promised, that walked it all the way out of their life, died 
died looking for that heavenly city and as pilgrims never never was benefited by the promises that they had by faith in other words the bigger picture of the promise not the small ones we know we looked at we've looked at all these people we've looked at Abel and we've looked at all these people it wasn't that God didn't bless them that in the bigger picture of their faith what their bigger picture was all these died all these died in faith without receiving the benefits of the promise you'd have to look at each one to see who it was but they had one thing in common when they died they they all went to the heavenly quote heavenly city okay they all went to a place prepared for them. In the Old Testament, they went to Sheol, to Abraham's bosom in paradise. In the New Testament, we go to, quote, the heavens. We go to the third heaven. It's just interesting when he says all these old covenant believers listed died, and he's talking about physical death here in the Greek, as an aorist act of indicative, and the word in, the word in is really not the word in. And it, this is kata plus the accused of Norman standard in the Greek language. And it should be translated according to, according to a divine Norman standard. All these died according to a divine Norman standard of faith. Let me tell you what that is for you in case you don't understand that. As a believer, what you get in death is dying grace. Your transfer from time to eternity, from the physical realm to the eternal realm. It's called dying grace. And let me tell you, dear heart, you will want that. Because the only people that get that are those who have been born again by the by the Holy Spirit when they believe the gospel of Jesus Christ. Or those in the Old Testament who believed it on the basis of it. All of these died in accordance to the divine norm and standard of faith. They all died in faith. They walked it out all their life. That doesn't mean they didn't question. We looked at Abraham and Sarah, right? It wasn't that they didn't question it, but they came back to walk it out. Did they get their child? That's not what he's talking about. That is not what he's talking about. Did they get their promise? Did God promise them a child? Did they get the child? That's not what he's talking about. Because they died without receiving what had been promised, right? Right? Ah, good. I just rung a bell. That's good. Now maybe we can get down to business. You do understand that. And that's true with all of these guys that are listed. It wasn't that God didn't give them promises. They didn't get the big one. Okay, I'll help you. Let's take Abraham and Sarah. They're, the seed was Isaac. The seed that's, that's the seed of Christ. That's the seed. How do you know that, Ron Adema? Galatians 3.16 says it. All right. I'll earn my money. I'll earn it. Look at, three, look at Galatians 3.16. Galatians 3.16. Now the promises were spoken to Abraham and to his seed. He does not say and to seeds as referring to many, but to one, and to your seed, that is what? Come on now, what's it say? Christ. They got Isaac, but they didn't get whom? Thank you, Christ. They got Isaac, but they didn't get Christ. Isaac is way down the line at the time of the birth of Christ. And the whole list in that old covenant is about that. 
They got the seed. They got promises, but they didn't get the promise, which was the coming of Christ. You live in the period when Christ came to the earth, went to the cross and died for you, was buried and raised on the third day to give you eternal life. That's the deal, buddy. You live in a period that nobody got to live in. You got to live in the historical coming, dying, resurrected Christ. And you know what you should be looking for? The second coming of Christ. You should be looking for Jesus to come back at any given day without any notice. That'll help you with your car payment, won't it? Think what they're going to get stuck with when Christ comes back and you're taken out of this world by rapture. So what does this mean? And they all died without receiving the promise. Well, if you study any of these guys, you're going to see it. They were all in the messianic lineage of Christ. Every bit of this is the lineage of Christ, right? These are all. It wasn't that they didn't receive promises. They didn't receive the big promise which was Christ, the coming of Christ. We are so academically lazy in the church, it just surprises me. Why isn't anybody interested in this stuff? You say, oh, Ron, you teach way too much. I don't teach half as much as I should. And I understand why people are not interested in this. All these died without, uh, uh, in accord all these died in accordance with the faith given to them without receiving the promise. Komaizo is such a great word for that. Komaizo. It's just a great word in the middle voice. They got, they got, they got benefited from it. Do you understand that? They walked it out looking for the coming of Christ in their lifetime. And he didn't come. We, we're, listen, we're doing the same thing. We're walking our life out on faith, looking for the coming of Christ. And our, our believers die. We have funerals all the time. They die. Right? Is, does, that, does that in any way hinder the coming? No. They died short of it. But I'll tell you, if they had a wit of doctrine and so they were looking for him coming before they ever went to him. That's walking by faith and not receiving the promises, right? We just had two that entered that realm out of our, our congregation. Kobaizo, just an interesting word. It's an interesting word in the book of Hebrews for this word is used in the 10th chapter 36 when he's talking about Habakkuk 2.4, which leads into this whole discussion of Hebrews 11. It is in Hebrews 11.13. It's also used in 19 in regard to Abraham in offering Isaac on the basis of believing in the resurrection. And then it's used again in 1139 of our chapter. So this is not the only time Komaizo has been used. In, in fact, it has been used in the book of Hebrew connected to this very subject. It was used in 1036, 1113, 19, and verse 39, all connected in this subject matter. Komaizo. Well, a smart writer. Hey, of course, God, God back in that whole thing, right? But Komaizo. You're talking about knowing that the Bible's inspired word of God, picking Komaizo out of 19 words to fit this. He didn't learn that in seminary. All of these having gained approval in in Hebrews 11.39, all of these having gained approval through their faith, like I, I just mentioned with Abraham and Sarah, they have Isaac, but they're looking for Christ, did not receive what was promised. 
eh? And you always look for why. They're going to tell you why. Point number two. I know. Look, I know you said I've never heard anybody. I've never heard any of this ever in my life. I know it. You are now, though. So you got no excuse after tonight. You got no excuse because God has brought you in here to teach you the Bible. Something you've been, you've sat with people who taught it and never taught it. Now you're sitting with somebody who teaches it. And you go, I don't know. I don't know. He's too deep for me. The Bible is not too deep for you. All I'm doing is teaching the Bible. Well, you're using Greek words. Of course I am. Of course I am. The Bible wasn't written in English. The original translation was in English. <laughs> Just, anyhow, the next point of interest to this le lesson is the Greek grammar. You go like, oh, no, here he goes. I know. I didn't write the Bible. I just read it. And the grammar is very important to the English translation. So here's what Hebrews 11, 13. This is so phenomenal. This is as phenomenal as komayo. Komaizo? When you, when you do a study of all 19 Greek words and they, this guy picks komaizo, you go like, Now, he does something in one verse. This is important in the Greek language, and that's important to how it's laid out. You can't see it in English. He gives you one main verb. And four participles. All of them. This is important. This is an aorist, active, indicative. Third person plural. That's why it's these and them. They. He puts all of these participles in aorist tenses. Nominative, plural, masculine. All of them. You say, well, big deal. That's a big deal. I wouldn't make it if it wasn't a big deal. In the Greek language, like in the English language, there are rules of grammar. Here's a rule of grammar that's important to this subject. The action of the participle the action of the participle, the action, the action of all of these is connected to the main verb. They work off the main verb. Now what? Now listen to me. If the main verb is an aorist tense and the participles A, B, C, D are aorist, it means that they work in conjunction to, with one another. Same time. They're engaged in the same function. Now, if one's aorist and one is an aorist, it changes the whole format. But when the aorist tense is of the main verb is connected, all four of these are aorist, which means that they're occurring at the same, in the same time slot as an aorist. It's an aorist action, which is a past time. All of this is connected to something in the past. <laughs> I know. Yeah, I know. See, I actually teach what I was taught. I actually teach what I was taught. I know, listen, people tell me, well, you, you're... Your people can't set, your people who sat in the pew can't learn this. They got the same Holy Spirit I got. What do you mean that people who sat in the pew can't learn what I learned?
Well, they're not as smart as you are. They got the Holy Spirit, they're smarter. All these died. Now watch this. The main verb is died. In the English, this is the word died. All of these died. That's the aorist tense. They all died. It's an aorist active indicative, third person plural. They all died according to their faith. Or what they said in their faith. Now watch. Watch the aorist participles without receiving, having seen, having welcomed, having confessed. Notice they're all aorist participles. Do you see that? They're all. The, the A on the front of every one of those words is aorist. I just didn't want, <laughs> I just didn't want to write it out every time. All right? The word without is a negative. That's the word may. You put a line above it, and that's a, that's a negative not. Without. It's attached to a front of a word. In English, we say without. Or it's translated literally not. Not receiving the promises. Now watch the participles. All, here's the main verb. They all died in faith. Aristotle's always pointing to, pointing to this point in time in past. Wait, look. The antediluvian period? The patriarch period? Right? That's the Aristotle's. That's the Aristotle's. They died. They died in, in that antediluvian period looking for the coming of Christ. They died in the patriotic period looking for the coming of Christ. You understand? When we go to the other ones looking for Christ. They were looking for Christ the same way we are. Except they were looking for his first coming to go to the cross, to be buried, to be raised from the dead. They were looking for the first coming of Christ. We're looking for the second coming. But they didn't talk that way in the Old Testament because the church wasn't in existence. So they talked about it as one thing. Without receiving the promise, having seen, having welcomed from a distance, having confessed that they were strangers and, and exiles on the earth, looking, looking, looking for the coming of Christ. While the faith cycle applies to all four listed groups in Hebrews 11, the first three groups didn't receive what had been promised according to 1139. Right? Look, gee whiz, when we get to verse 39, we've looked at it. We've gone all the way from four to 40, and the last verse is everybody listed in there didn't get it. Now, they got promises, but they didn't get the promise. What were they all looking for? What was their life dedicated to? The same thing ours is. Christ and his coming. Theirs was prophetic Christ and him coming. A prophetic Christ who was coming. Like John the Baptist, he preached that Christ is coming in our generation. I've been sent to introduce him to you. John, the first chapter, John, St. John, chapter 1. They didn't receive the promise. Watch this now. This is so good. Until verse 40. Look, they didn't get it. Listen, the promise that they were looking for finally got fulfilled. Look at verse 39 and 40. All these having gained approval through their faith, they, you know what, gained approval? They worked their life, they, they stayed for, they walked their life by faith right out to the end. They went through saving grace, logistical grace, glory grace, suffering grace, dying grace, right into surpassing grace, through dying grace. They gained approval of their walk of faith and still didn't receive the promise in verse 39. Because, here's the why, and why is that so, Ron? Because, verse 40, God had provided something better 
for us. Who is the us? That's the New Covenant believers. That's who the book of Hebrews is written to. Then he goes on, so that apart from us, they should not be made complete. Perfect means complete. Their, their faith finally gets finished. Whoa, wait now, you're going to miss this. Their faith is not going to be completed until the coming of Christ. Your faith is not going to be completed until the coming of Christ. You do know under that. Don't you understand that? My goodness. When he comes, returns, the church is going to be removed from the earth, dear hearts. hoo -ah. And do you know when that's going to be? No, and nobody else does, and don't let them tell you they know it. We call it eminence, the eminence of his coming. They, these people are looking for the eminence of what we call the first coming of Christ. Just like we are looking for the second coming of Christ. And their faith is completed in, uh, in the fourth runner. Their race is completed by the fourth runner. That's when the victory is won. All these, point three, all these old covenant believers who represented their group lived by the faith cycle. They believed in the reality of its fulfillment with the coming of Christ into the world. Galatians 4.4, 4, when the fullness of time had come, that's the aorist tense and fulfillment of reality. When the fullness of time came, God sent forth his son, born of a woman born under the law. Galatians 3.16, the seed of Abraham was Christ. It wasn't Isaac. It was Christ. Isaac was the prototype. Isaac was the prototype. That's why he took him up to Mount Moriah and put him on an altar to offer him. And God said, wait. That's for my son. Here's Romans 5, 6. While we were still helpless, at the right time, Christ died for the ungodly. You know what he called you before you got saved? Helpless. You know, you know what you shouldn't be after you get saved? Helpless. helpless. I can't tell you how many helpless people I meet in my life who need Christ. They need him in a real way. Because they're helpless people. They need help, but they need Christ. Christ is where your help comes from. You do realize this life is temporary. Think how many people now, let's say you're, let's say you're 40. I'm being generous. Let's say you're 40. By the time you're 40, how many people do you think how many funerals do you think you've been to by the time you were 40? You know? I, listen, I w in my high school, I went to a lot of funerals in my high school before I ever, got out of, before I ever graduated. <coughs> and the last time I went to a funeral was my senior year after we had graduated and I, we buried three of my classmates who died on um, graduation night. And let me tell you, I've been to a lot of funerals over my life. What's that teach you? Does it teach you anything? Yeah, life is temporary. Y you, live, you live and think it's permanent till you go to a funeral and then it dawns on you, holy catfish. Life is a vapor. I don't know that you know that when you're a teenager. 
But when they started giving you senior discounts, <laughs> it, it dawns on you, life is a vapor. Life is just a vapor. But I'm going to tell you, Christ didn't die any time. Listen, Christ didn't die at any time. He died at what time? What time? Right time. The right time. Not any time. Listen to that Hebrew, uh, listen to Romans 5, 6. While we were helpless at the right time, Christ died for the ungodly. That's that era's tense up there. They all believed he would come in their lifetime, just like we believe about the second coming of Christ. They all died in faith, like many as of, looking for the second coming. They were looking for the first and what it would bring to the world. They were looking to what Christ, when Christ came into the world, what it would bring the world. Do you have any idea what Christ has brought the world? I mean, just ponder that sometime. When you go to the beach and you're sitting out there, lying out there or walking down the beach, think about what Christ has brought to the world. This is what they were looking for. And listen, we look for the second coming, listen to me, and what he will bring to the world. Agreed? Mm -hmm. What do we call that? Millennium? Right? The millennium. They were looking for that whole ball game. <laughs> oh, people, I don't know that we understand what Christ brought us to the, what he brought to the world because we don't talk to the world enough about it. We don't talk about it enough. At the bottom on your homework, your housework, or wh wh however you do your studies, I want you to pay attention. How were people saved during the period, uh, during, uh, how were they saved prior to Christ coming into the world? How were people saved? I'm, I am appalled by how many people don't understand how people in the Old Testament got saved. Galatians 3, 3, 8 tell you, Abraham got saved by the gospel. What was that? That was a prophetic gospel. That Christ would come. I mean, man, you can't read Psalms 22, Isaiah 52, 53. I mean, this, these are... Well, anyhow... How do we get saved? We get saved by the historical gospel. Christ came. He went to Golgotha, the hill called the skull in his day. And there he died for our sins, was buried, and raised on the third day. I mean, people go and look at the hill today. In the Old Testament, it was prophetic. In our day, they can actually go to Jerusalem and walk to the hill. They couldn't do that. They had to see it from afar. As opposed to us, we can see it near. Well, anyhow. Well worth your read, because I'm telling you, people don't understand it. Well worth your read. I hear it all the time. Well, how were they saved in the Old Testament? That I get so much criticism for preaching that Christ died for your sins, was buried and raised from the dead on the third day in order to be saved. They go, well, how did people get saved in the Old Testament without that? I went, holy mackerel. Read the first half of the book, but don't forget to read the second half of the book because it tells you how it all works. <laughs> well, anyhow, it's all right. Let's have a word of prayer, then we're going to have a time of prayer for those who have requests. In a moment, this will be a good time for you to have prayer and, and watch God answer your prayer. How about that? Have God answer your prayer. Yeah. First prayer you ought to pray. I'm going to tell you the first prayer you ought to pray is your salvation prayer. I believe that Jesus Christ died for my sins, was buried and raised from the dead the third day to save my soul for time and eternity. That's the prayer you ought to pray first. And the second prayer is whatever kind of needs you might have, whatever you think is, is an essential need in your life is what your second prayer ought to be. Let us pray. Uh, Heavenly Father, we thank you today for these that have come our way by the automobile and the internet to study with us the Hebrew passage about faith. Faith is the assurance of things hopeful and the conviction of things not seen. And these, 
Then he goes into a list people of wonderful people that lived it without receiving the promise because they were looking for the coming of Christ. In the book of Luke, Father, when Christ is born into the world, people got so excited that were looking for that event called the consolation of Israel. Oh, Father, we live in this marvelous period of time historically. And what has Christ brought to this world, Father, is amazing. It is amazing, but it all works. It all works off from the gospel or it doesn't work. I pray tonight, Father, that the Holy Spirit would touch our lives in significantly important ways that we might have a spiritual awakening in our soul about what it means to be saved and be saved and look to God as our Heavenly Father to take care of our needs in a most personal way. For we've made our prayer in Jesus' name. Amen.